acknowledge you. And last week we covered a message about the power of the ordinary. The power of the ordinary was a message that, that I think some, they, they, a couple of people, I think they caught it driving down the road and, and a couple of days later it, it got their attention and said, oh my goodness. You know, and, and realized that every day we have an opportunity to do a kind, ordinary act that has supernatural potential. Yes. Every day, every, every opportunity, you have an opportunity at work, at the coffee shops, at the gas stations, where everywhere you go, you have an opportunity to operate in the power of the ordinary and do something and with just a word, a hug, a smile, a kind act that can have eternal consequences. It can either draw someone to Christ or it can push them away. Just this past week, we saw CNN and Fox, and uh, uh, they had a poll that, uh, that it, they're, they're identifying that the millennials and, and people in, in general in America are leaving the church in droves. And even the number of people uh, that have said that they don't even believe in God anymore, or they believe just in a generic God, and they take Jesus out of the equation, has dropped off dramatically just in the last seven or eight years. And, and I will tell you that the message of Jesus Christ is right. But the messengers sometimes taints the message. Yeah. And so tonight we have a message that, that I believe that is, go, is going to help shape your mindset and help you in your personal journey. And in the end you're going to see the benefits to, to you as a believer. Because sometimes... Believe it or not, even as us mature Christians, sometimes there always got to be a what's in it for us. Yeah. <laughs> it shouldn't be that way because Jesus already paid the price. We, it, we shouldn't be worried about a thing. Yeah. But the reality is because of a way we've been shaped by our, the consumerism and materialism and what we see around us and what we become, uh, that, and everything has to be convenient. Yeah. And I was shaking my head when my wife said, it's hot in here. And I'm like, it ain't hot to me. Hell is hot. <laughs> and I ain't going to hell. Nope. That's what I was thinking. I said, hey, I, I, you know, it, it, it's a little warm, and that's my fault. I didn't turn the air conditioning on early enough. And, you know, when, when electricity bills are $2,500 a month, you know, during the, oh, the winter or the peak summertime, you try to watch the, the bill and you try to be a good steward. Amen. Amen. And, but I'll do better next week. I'll make sure I, I bring it down a little earlier so we make sure we don't have this problem. But even with that being said, I think it's still 72, 73 in here. But the reality is, hell is a lot hotter than anywhere we'll, we'll experience. But this message is that uh, we talked about the power of the ordinary last week. Tonight, uh, I would like to come from the perspective of being the message. Being the message. I'm going to come from John chapter 1, verse 14. I'll start there. Because the reality is that there's two, if you, if you poll people who don't go to church and people who have rejected Christianity, the overriding number of people who say they've rejected God and rejected church is that they rejected it based on the people they've interacted with who say they are Christians. Not based on, because we're not perfect. We know that. We got a lot of flaws and mistakes and issues. But the problem is, is that our attributes, that the fruit that we show sometimes and the way we treat people and the way we talk to people can be in a self-righteous, judgmental manner. And, and the millennials and the younger generation are saying, I don't have to tolerate someone talking down to me. I don't, I don't need someone to tell me uh, 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 about a God or about going to hell when, when they, they, don't even, they, they don't even seem like they even care about me. Right. Amen? Amen? And so this message is for those who uh, understand that there is power in everything you do. And there's power in every action, every word you say. Because the reality is that there is power in the words and there's power of life and death in your tongue. Amen. Yes. And the reality, and, and I, I keep saying the reality because you have to have, and I'm, what I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm prompting something by saying it is important and it's real because I'm, I'm being transparent, but I'm also bringing truth to you. The fact is that a lot of times we as Christians are the meanest folk on the planet. 
They say in America that, that more waiters and waitresses call off on Sunday afternoons than any other time of the year or any time of the week. And the reason why is because church folk after church, they go out to eat and they go to tables and sit there for two or three hours. And they'll talk to each other and they won't even talk to the waitress. And see, if you want to know how someone really is, you know, watch how someone treats a waiter or a waitress. No matter how they engage with you in a conversation. If they just dismiss the person who's waiting on them and treat them like they're nothing, you can see a lot about their heart. Go ahead and check it out. But as Christians, you know, you know, they'll say that, and the waitresses will call up because they say, not only this, they said that the Christians are the cheapest folk. They'll take a table up for two or three hours and talk the whole time. And then, and here's the thing, they'll be talking about each other, talking about other Christians, and saying negative things, and, 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 and saying things that are not very kind. And what happens is that uh, after they're done, they leave a Bible track on the table and don't even leave them a tip. And think it's cute. And, 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 and try to convince themselves that was the right thing to do because they're just trying to help them get saved. No, you just made that person mad. Yeah. How about anyone that would want to go to church and what they think about Christians, they don't want anything to do with us right. because they see us being cheap, condescending, self-righteous. They can't pay their rent or their utilities off your track. Right. Amen. Can I get an amen in here? Amen. And so the reality for us as Christians and believers, we should be the kindest, most generous, most benevolent people on the planet because we can never repay the debt of what Jesus has done for us. Amen. So this message is about being the message. Amen. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And verse 16 says, And of his fullness have all we received a grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the message. He was the word that came walking. He was God himself. In a man, in a body, 2,000 years ago, he walked this earth himself, and he was the word. He was the Bible. He was the fullness of the Godhead. Walking this earth, he was the message. What people saw and what they heard from him was a man that was loving. What they saw was a man that was selfless. What they saw was a man who, who didn't fight you when you fought them. He was a man who did not have negative things to say. But rather, he, was, he got betrayed and he was whooped, he was spit upon, he was judged, he was mistreated. And yet, he still died for all. Yeah. Jesus, it was the message. But, but the reality is that that was the message 2,000 years ago. And, two, and then he was ascended to the Father. But who is the message now? Jesus is the message, but we are the messengers. And we are the message everywhere we go. And we should be full of grace. Because God's grace is in us. We should be full of truth in us. We should be full of love in us. And uh, I mean, St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times. And when necessary, use words. Amen. <laughs> Jesus didn't have to say something all the time. His actions spoke for him. Yes. First thing I want you to understand about being the message is that we must have compassion. Yes. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. In those days, being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude. Did you get that? I have compassion yeah, yeah. on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. Yeah. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way, for divers of them came from far. Mm -hmm. You see, Jesus understood practical needs. Mm -hmm. Jesus understood before people could sit down and, and hear, you know, if, if they're in need, that they don't want to hear a whole lot that he had to say unless he met that need. It's hard for someone to sit there and hear the gospel and they, ain't, they haven't ate, ate in three days. Can I get an amen? amen? When's the last time you went three days without eating unless you had a serious medical condition? 
It wasn't going. And Jesus understood that there was a practical need that had to go on. And, and then he also, he blows our minds. See, because we as Christians, we think that we're only supposed to hang around Christians. We think that we're just our church folk and, and we just are for no more and then we go hang out with each other. We heard with each other and we, we, do, we speak Christianese. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. And, uh, good. Amen, amen, brother. Amen, sister. And that, that people think we're, we're at an Amway convention or something. I mean, yeah. you know, you know but, but, but the reality is we should make a mark everywhere we go, but the mark should be love, not self-righteousness. But Jesus hung around people who were not like the, the typical church person. See, this message is not for the religious folk. This message is for people who are serious about Jesus. Yeah. Jesus came to turn the world upside down and change people's Amen. mentality who the King of Kings is. He didn't come here to ride a big white stallion or to slay the Romans. He didn't come here to confound the wise with a bunch of philosophy, but rather he came to confound them with the mysteries and power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Yeah. But Matthew 9, verses 11 through 13, he says, and when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Jesus hung around tax collectors and sinners. Yeah. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, yeah. but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth, and I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous. But sinners to repentance. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. I thank you Jesus came for a sinner like me. Yeah. And everywhere we go, we had to have that mentality that, that we're not better than anyone else. It was just the grace of God that has protected us and kept us. It was the grace of God that kept us from condemnation and judgment. Yeah. Yes. Being the message means that we should exude love, grace, and truth. Yes. Second thing, I'll let you know, um, before I get to the second thing, we talked last week uh, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verses 17 through 21, and we drove home about, uh, we are called to the ministry of reconciliation. We all are called to the ministry of reconciliation. And what's that mean? Is that before we had a relationship with Jesus Christ, we were not presentable to God. Did you get that? Before we were reconciled, before we got saved, we were enemies of God. God was not an enemy of us. We were enemies of Him. Yes. Did you get that? Because God loved us so much, He sent His only begotten Son to die for us. Yes. But until you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you cannot be presented to the Father because you have sin on us. We have sin on us. Yes. And you cannot get in front of perfection with sin. Right. And so God uh, has to have us get reconciled to the Father through His Son, Jesus yes. Christ. And our sins had to be washed whiter than snow, and that's only by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And every one of us is called to that ministry of reconciliation to help those to be snatched from darkness into the light. Yeah. Yeah. Changed from the army of darkness into the army of lightness. Yeah. It's made up a word. Yeah. And so, the second thing though we, that I want to drive home to you tonight about a point about being the message is that practical acts of kindness will produce the gravity of love in your life. Did you get that? The gravity of love. Everyone in here, the truth be told, wants to be loved. And if you say you don't want to be loved, you're lying. And you need to come to the altar right now. Because God is love. And God created us to be relational. In fact, when he created Adam, he says, it's not good for man to be alone, but he, you, you needed to have a helpmate. You needed someone to be with you, so he created Eve from his rib. Yep. He did not create us to be alone, but he's created us to be relational, to have people in our life, but we all want to be what? Love. In order for us to be loved, though, we have to be lovable. And so practical acts of kindness, what it does, it, it creates, uh, it allows us to, to, to become, uh, have the gravity of love in our life. Meaning that as I'm treating people the right way, as I'm, as I'm being kind to people, as I'm speaking to people, I'm looking in their eyes, I'm make, making sure that they know that they're important to me. That I'm acknowledging people for who they are. I, I shake their hand or give them a hug or I remember their name or I have a smile on my face regardless how bad it is. What I'm doing is I'm exuding love. 
for a practical act of kindness. Wow. It doesn't cost me anything to hug you. It doesn't cost me anything to say it could be kind to you. It doesn't cost me anything to, to, to just to open up the door for you. It doesn't cost me anything just to say something nice out of the way to provide hope. And what it does, it allows you to start having the gravity of love in your life. People start, be start drawn to you. Instead of you being a lightning rod where people don't want anything to do with you because they say, oh, here he comes. He's a shark. Yeah. She's a shark. Yeah. She come to talk, she's come to talk to me about Jesus. And, and they're coming with your Bible. Thump, Bible thumper. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing wrong being a Bible thumper, but first be a lover. Yeah. 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 Be a person that understands that we were unlovable at one time. Yeah. That God saw through our stuff. And sent someone into our life that, that spoke to us, that loved us first. Because how many times did how many times did someone interact with us before we accepted Jesus Christ? Wow. How many touches? How many exchanges? How many conversations? I mean, there must have been hundreds for me. I mean, I don't know how many people tried to tell me about Jesus, and, and I didn't. I, I didn't want to hear you yeah. if you came to me in a self righteous man. Right. I don't want to hear you when you start telling me where I'm going. <laughs> I'm like, where am I going? <laughs> I said, well, I'm going. I'm going to go there quickly. Yeah. But rather, it was when someone ministered to me, they got my phone number and reached out to me and offered me a spaghetti dinner. Yeah. When I was in a, in a time of need and a crisis in my life, this crisis Christianity, I was ready to give up. My life was messed up. And I needed someone in my life who would listen to me, pray for me. And they called me. They offered me dinner. And they gave me dinner. And that night, I got saved. Yeah. Yeah. How many conversations did I have before then? I mean, how many interactions? But people, but when people, what happens is as you're being kind to people, people will be drawn to you. Ephesians 4.32. It says, And be ye kind one to another. Yeah. Yeah. Tender hearted. Yeah. Forgiving one another. Yeah. Even as God for Christ's sake had forgiven you. How can we call ourselves Christians and we walk around with a chip on our shoulder, not forgiving others? Glory to God. We have to be able to show forgiveness to others. And we have to be able to be kind to others. Because how can we extend the same kindness that God has extended to us? Well, let's, well, let's get a little for Titus. Titus chapter 3. And I'll start at verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to, to every good work. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. To every good work. Yeah. To speak evil of what? No man. Not some people. No man. Not the ones you don't like. No. It says of what? No man. And that means no woman too. To be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all weakness unto what? All men. All men. So that's kindness to everyone. Yes. Even if they're a heathen. Even if they're talking bad about you. Even if they're persecuting you. Even if, if they're a Satanist. Even if they're, even if they're on the opposing team. We still have to show meekness and kindness. Yes. I didn't write the book. <laughs> Because I wish it didn't have that. I wish it just said some of the people. Because there's some people that get on my nerves. Yep, yep. Well, I lie when the truth will do. Yeah. There's some people who've done some things to me and talked about me who really work on my nerves. When I even hear their name or I see them, I want to choke them out. I want to put my hands and lay my hands on them and then get them like Lazarus and raise them back up. <laughs> But God has called me to the ministry of reconciliation, not to the ministry of fighting. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Amen. And if he's called me, he's called what? Yeah. You ain't no better than me. Yeah. We on the same team. Yeah. And so if I got to do the ministry of reconciliation, you got to do the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. We all got to be kind. Yeah. We got to be kind to everyone. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, we have a responsibility to be kind to them. Yes. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers, lust and pleasures, living in malice, and envy, hateful, and hating one another. Isn't that, isn't that how we were? Yes. 
mean, sometimes we still, right? Yeah. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That being justified by His grace, not your grace, Michael, but His grace. We shall be made heirs according to the hopes of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. It, it, notice it says that, that thou will affirm constantly. Meaning that I'm saying continuously, perpetually, and I'm reminding you over and over and over again because they understood, and, and the Holy Scripture and those who wrote it, they understand that we were going to struggle, we were going to have issues with this. It's saying constantly I'm affirming that they which have believed in God, it is they those who did believe in God, that those believed in God, might be careful to maintain good works. Yeah. These things are good and profitable unto men. Yeah. See, good works don't save you. Yeah. <clears throat> but good works produce the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. When you exercise kindness, you can walk in joy. Yeah. When you treat people right, you reap what you sow. Oh. Oh, God. You can clap. You can give God a clap on that. But we have a responsibility to go out and do good works. Amen. To win souls, to love people. But it's much more. It, the end product is always to win souls. Yeah. But the reality of that is that you just can't go out there and say, I'm going to go catch and, and, and win a soul right now. It, you have to Plant seeds and you have to water. And that's done through kindness, through love, through kind action. And third thing I would like to give you is that quit making it so complicated being a Christian. Part of the reason people get confused about the message is because we make it so complicated. Repeat me after me. No laws. No laws. Just love. Just love. Oh, that feel good? Yeah. Just love. No laws. Just love. 1 John chapter 3. And I'll start at verse 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we pass from death unto life, because we love the brother. He that loveth not his brother abided in death. Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer, and ye know that mur no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby receive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath, whoso hath this world's good, and see his brother have need, and shut up of his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Yeah. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongues, but in deed and in truth. Yeah. Love is an action word. Yeah. Just saying you love someone is just words. Yeah. But it is real, it's truth, it's deed when we put it in actions. Yeah. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God? And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments, and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. And he that keepeth His commandments dwell in Him, and He in Him. And hereby we know that He abided in us by the Spirit which He had given us. You want to know how Jesus is in us? It's that we love God and love thy neighbor. Yes. Instead of spending so much time telling people what thou shalt not do, yeah. spend more time loving God. Amen. Loving our neighbor. Yeah. Because here's the key. This is how grace is. is that if, we teach, if we just love God, we reverence Him, we worship Him, we praise Him, then we're not worried about offending Him. Because we're trying to please Him. Did you get that? Yeah. 
See, when, and, and we're spending our time invested in reaching or, 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 or trying to have a relationship with him. When I was dating my wife, courting my wife, I thought about everything I could to get to, to, to get with her. I, I mean, I, I literally, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go out to take her to the movies here. I'm, you know, and as soon as I drop her off, I'm already thinking about what I'm going to take her the next day. Wow. I'm already thinking about what kind of flowers to get. I'm already thinking about, okay, this, this, what, I, I told her the first day we arrived, I said, I'm going to marry you. You know, but, 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 but the thing is, every time we went out, I was already planning for the next time. Amen. What if we did that with Jesus? Amen. Every time we talk to Him and, and we have a conversation with Him, we pray and we read the Word, we're already planning for the next time. Yeah. It's yeah. continuous. Yes. Hallelujah. That's when you, when you don't have to worry about telling people a bunch of shout nots right. when we're just praising God. about thou shalt not steal and, 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 and kill when you love your neighbor because you're not going to kill your neighbor if you love them. You're not going, you're not going to, to try to, to sleep with your neighbor's wife or husband if you love them. If you love them, you're not going to steal from them, but rather you're going to give to them. Instead of all these shall not, let's just talk about God. I love God and love my neighbor. Quit making it so complicated. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. But, but our, the message that we convey sometimes, we make it so hard and, and people can't get to the message because we, we confuse them based on what we say and, and how we treat them and how we come across. And, and the next thing I would say, your anoint, anointing, our anointing is of no effect because we missed the point. The anointing gives us the ability to do something easier. It makes your engine uh, run easier. It allows you to operate in your giftedness a lot easier. But what happens with us, we can't operate under anointing because we miss the point. Because if, 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 we, if God allowed us to operate in anointing by missing the point, we would get ourselves in trouble. Yeah. We would start taking the credit for everything. <laughs> but Luke 4.18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Yeah. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance, to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. See, we're called to reach those in the prison. Yeah. We're anointed to go set the captives free. We're anointed to go reach the poor. And we're anointed to go help those who are blind and can't see. A blind person might be rich, yeah. but they can't see the gospel and hear the gospel based on how we treat them. Yeah. And so we miss the point of the anointing. It's of no effect because we miss the point of what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. We're supposed to be reaching the poor. We're supposed to be helping the blind. We're supposed to be reaching those who are broken and help them become whole. And we, they cannot get that because we're communicating a different message other than what God is telling us. He's telling us to love God and love thy neighbor. Yeah. Being a message is nothing more than treating people the right way, loving them to Jesus, showing them that we love God and we are not rocked by every circumstance. We're not rocked by everything that happens around us. We don't get in, in, in arguments about politics. We don't get arguments on, on Facebook based on your political persuasion or where you come from, but rather God is love and we should love one another. Yeah. And doing good will result in God being with us. Acts 10. See, God is already with us. I, I think Pastor Fernando, I hear him back there. It's one of our scriptures that we, we kind of go back and forth with and we have fun with it. Acts 10, verse 38. Hey, yeah. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Yeah. See, doing good will result in power being with you. See, God could be with you, or He, or he can really be with you. Yeah, that's it. See, Beverly, we as believers, we know God is with us. Right. But see, what I want, and hopefully you want, is to operate in His power. Yes. Yeah. And see, if we're going to conduct ourselves as like a disciple of Jesus Christ, what He's saying is that we need to go around doing good, wow. yeah. treating people right. Yeah. Loving them even when they're unlovable, even when they're mistreating us, even when they're coming against us and being our enemy, we still have a responsibility to do good. Yes. And when we are doing good, what happens is God sees that he can trust us. Yes. He said, okay, I, I gave you a little power before and you did okay. Yeah. And next time, 
You're going to have a little bit, double for your trouble, a little bit more power. The more he can trust you, the more power he can give you. And the power is not for your good. It's for his good, for his glory. Someone give God praise for that right there. And so the, and the amount of power that God will release in your life is predicated on how you treat people. Did you get that? Some didn't like that. The amount of power that God will give you is predicated on how you treat people. The reason why some people will be broke all their life is because they don't, they won't meet the need of someone else. If, if, if they get blessed with forty-two dollars and they come across someone and, 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 and all they ask for a dollar, and all of a sudden say, "I can't afford to give you a dollar," and they realize they're entertaining an angel that day. And God was checking them, getting a heat check on them, and seeing uh, where their treasure was. Yeah. He was checking them to see if they could trust Him with more. Yeah. And see, God will give you more and release more when He sees He can trust you with more. Right. But I don't know about you, but I want God with me, and I want His power. Yeah. And He can trust me, and I hope He can trust you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God, and, then, and even a cup of water can change the course of your life. Yeah. Mark 10, verse 42. Mark 10, verse 42. I'm sorry, Matthew 10, verse 42. And we get to, uh, yeah, verse 42. And whosoever shall give the drink unto one of these little ones a cup of water, a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. Yeah. <laughs> so even a cup of water, there could be a reward for you. Yeah. That may seem so insignificant for the person who just glances through the Bible, and you see that and, and you don't catch what's going on there. But understand that every person you interact with every day is your greatest opportunity for supernatural results in your life. Yeah, yeah. That's so true. Every person you interact with, every person is an opportunity to operate in the power of the ordinary where supernatural results can happen. Someone can get saved based on how you treat them. Yes. You can operate in a power that you never operated before if you learn, if we learn how to treat every person right, have a smile on our face, and understand that they are our greatest ministry, the ministry of one. Every person in front of us is the greatest and most important person in our life other than Jesus Christ. They are significant. They are important. And we are supposed to minister to them, love them, help them, and listen to them. And don't be self-righteous and telling everyone what to do, but rather listen. God gave us two ears and one mouth. Listen a little bit more and understand where people are coming from so we can meet real needs. Yeah. Yeah. Being the message. Being the message. Yeah. And so, as I get ready to close this message up, our church is such a blessing. That I, when I see people, Amen. what they do, just this past week in the thrift store, we had, we had a guy that, I, he, he's pretty sick, he comes to the store uh, almost every day. And we were able to deliver a chair to him up on the third floor, and we were able to move some stuff for him, and, and he's, very, he's very grateful. It's not a significant thing to some people, but, but to him, it's the world that someone would take the time yeah. to go up a third floor and carry this big chair and then take another chair out and, 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 and do it with no strings attached yeah. and no cost. Yeah. And every day he comes through and he ends up buying like uh, uh, breakfast stuff for people that are coming through, whoever's at the store. And the thrift store is like his church. Yeah. It comes a place where he understands the love of God is radiant from people, emanating from people, the people in our church, and he feels it and senses it. And even he just got, he's so sick, and it, sometimes he passes out and he can't get out. He'll just park his car in the emergency lane and put his lights on and just come in and just want to just say hello to, to Karen or my wife or Pam or Sarah, what, what, whoever's there, and he just wants to hug them. Yeah. And he just wants to shake their hand and feel the love of God. 
And we know that he, 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 he every day he's, he's blessed when it happens. And this past week, we, our veterans home, our recovery home, we had someone that moved in this week and he came to a meeting and we found out his, someone's very close to him, like a sister, is in dire condition medically. And Gib took the time to, to find out what was going on and he called up the hospital and talked to this young lady and talked to the family members and but he just didn't call. He said, you know what? I'm gonna come on up there to MCB. Yeah. Amen. And understanding he only has one car and yeah. him and his wife are commuting to take care of the grandkids and got a lot of uh, other things going on. And he, he drove up to MCB. And while he was up there, the one, the young lady who they said it may, probably won't come out of the hospital alive unless God intervenes. Right. She had one request. Wow. She had one request, uh, uh, Redneck, to be baptized. Wow. And, and give up there in the hospital, uh, pray with this young lady and baptize her in MCV. Come on, give God praise. says quench not the spirit in a home and Christian standard uh, Kimberly what it means is that don't put out the fire yeah, yeah. don't put out the fire Jesus. And, then, and then when we look at Exodus chapter 3 verses, verses 2 and 3 Moses he went a burning bush he saw the burning bush he was not scared of that fire nope. it reminds me when we go to Matthew 5 and 13 to 14 that we are to be the salt and we are to be the light Salt pr protects and sustains food. Yeah. Yes. Savor it and flavor it. And you need it. But light in a city, back in the day, they didn't have electricity, right? right. But what they had was fire. Yeah. They had logs. We're not to quench the spirit because we need a fire. Yes. The city needs a light. Yeah. And see, if it's just you and I, just one of us, eventually our log will get quenched. We need each other. Yeah. See, because if, it, if my log is by itself, eventually it's going to get wet. Yeah. The wind's going to blow up and it doesn't have anything to burn, any embers to burn off it. But when we come together yeah. and we are glorifying God That's it. and we're loving one another, we can expect holy fire. Yeah. We can expect the Holy Ghost fire to come in this place. Yeah. in a city. Yeah. Oh. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. And so God has called us to be fire. Yes. Be the light. Yes. My fire should spark your fire and your fire should spark my fire. And when we're praising God, we should feel a holy fire coming down. Because every time we leave here, we should be bright embers everywhere we go. Being a light in a dark world. Telling people and showing people the love of Jesus everywhere we go. We should be making a difference because when we walk in the room, we're change agents. We change the thermostat everywhere we go. Because when we come in, when we walk in, it gets hot up in there. Because of the fire all over us. The glow of God. See, Moses wasn't spiritual over a burning bush, but rather he was on fire. The glow that radiated from him. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. So I don't know about you, but I'm ready to lift up the name of Jesus right in here, right now. Come on, let's give God praise right in here. Hallelujah.